Well, welcome, 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 everybody. Thank you very much for joining us on this beautiful sunny afternoon. My name's Mark Littlewood. I'm the Director General of the Institute of Economic Affairs. Great pleasure to be welcoming back our guest of honour um, to join us for an in-conversation today. We've got a lot to get through. Uh, it doesn't need much of an introduction, but he's going to get one anyway. Uh, scourge of the political establishment. Uh, living, breathing, walking, talking nightmare for the Liberal Metropolitan Elite previously the leader of UKIP and the Brexit Party, uh, a man whose detractors say he never actually successfully got elected to the domestic parliament, but so successful was he at being elected again and again to the foreign parliament that he eventually achieved his lifelong ambition of escaping its embrace, uh, reckoned by many to be the most influential politician of a generation or more. Please give a very warm welcome to Nigel Farage. Thank you. So, Nigel, great. I've got to start with Brexit, I think. So, this was your uh, passion for years and years and years, sort of, you know, so were you sort of, you know, member number five of UKIP or something, weren't you? When yeah, you I was pretty early through the doors. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I mean, for me, the big moment for me was 1990. It was, it was when we joined the exchange rate mechanism, and I just said to myself, why are we doing this? I worked on the London Metal Exchange at the time, and, well, as I always say, in those days in the city, we worked in the mornings, the afternoons were negotiable. <laughs> um, I was very rarely back. But, but, you know, when the phone rang, it could be Paris, it could be Frankfurt, but it was more likely to be Singapore or Santiago. You know, it was genuinely a global market, London was the leader. And so I started to ask myself questions about in the late 80s, why are we inextricably linking ourselves to just one economic trading area of the world? And then when we joined the exchange rate mechanism, I remember, I remember the evening, it was October 1990, Major was the new Chancellor, took us in to this fixed parity system, and I knew enough about the history of economics to know these things never, ever, ever, ever work. Um, but it was clear to me that the political establishment in Britain wanted us to join what then became known as the Euro, and that was across the board, you know, most Conservatives were going in that direction. And that was the moment, really, Mark, that I just said, I just, I just I disagree with everybody. I remember the next morning getting the train from Sevenoaks in, in, into London, going through the newspapers, and there was the odd commentator, um, people like Walters, who, who'd advised Thatcher, but basically every trade union, every employer's organisation, every political party, and every newspaper editor thought we'd done the right mm -hmm. thing. And I thought we'd done the wrong thing. And thus, thus began the lonely battle. And then when I came across Alan Sked, this academic at the LSE, who said, look, we've got to set up a political party, I, I wasn't sure. I went to a meeting in Westminster Hall. I hadn't been to a meeting for 10 years. I hadn't been to a meeting since I was at school. Too busy having lunch. And, uh, well, <laughs> yeah, well, or recovering from it. <laughs> I mean, uh, one shouldn't glory some of the aspects of it, but it was bloody good fun. Um, and, and I went to a meeting, and Peter Shaw spoke, and John Biffin spoke. It was in 92. And they talked about the forthcoming intergovernmental conference, which we now know as Maastricht. And both Shaw and Biffin, but Shaw was an amazing orator, an unbelievably powerful orator. And they spoke about the forthcoming treaty. They talked about the fact the EC was going to become the EU, what it meant, uh, that effect effectively we were heading for provincial status. Um, and... I think the audience were sort of, in a way, even though they were sort of, I think it was campaign for independent Britain, but we were still quite shocked, I think, by the magnitude of what these two elder statesmen were saying. And somebody got up on the floor and said, um, well, if that's the case, how should we vote in the forthcoming general election? And Shaw said vote Labour, and Biffin said vote Conservative. <laughs> and Alan Sked got up and said, I'm Alan Sked from the LSE, and said, what is the point? If you tell me that your parties are, are taking the country in a catastrophic direction, he said, I, you know, and he then had the anti-federalist league. Yeah. And I then thought to myself, I thought the British establishment is so sold out to the European project. The idea that I should stay within the Conservatives and try and influence from within was for the birds. And that's began the journey. And just, uh, I mean, I want to, you know, race forward another sort of, you know, 15, 20, 30 years. But yeah. 
Did you, you must have thought at the time that you were just putting a kind of honourable flag in the ground, that you were going to sort of, here I stand, I can do no other, we'll get 1% of the vote, I might beat the local residents association, I'm never going to win back my deposit, you know, it was, did you actually sort of see it as a, I or remember. did you sort of think, oh no, I can see in 20 years time we will start to get millions of votes and th frighten the mainstream parties and all the rest of it? I thought in terms of historical context we made a massive mistake, massive mistake. And I remember having this conversation in the early mid-90s, you know, in my local village pub, in the golf club, with the blokes I worked with in the city, about the big picture of whether we should be an independent country or not. And I realised then there was a massive disconnect that existed between where the country was and where Westminster and much of the media was. Um, but no, I mean, when um, UKIP was formed in... UKIP was formed in September 93, and a few weeks later, we woke to the news that the Conservative Member of Parliament for Eastleigh had died in, some might remember, somewhat unusual circumstances. Do you remember? The, 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 the stockings and the thing round the neck and the orange in the mouth. And it all depends where you went to school, I suppose, how you feel about it. But. <laughs> and so, you know, UKIP faced its first ever by election, and I said, I am that soldier. And I did it, got a thousand votes. Um, and even if it was just a futile jester, I enjoyed it so much. Right. I decided that say, it sort of fighting elections became my hobby. I thought, Mark, I honestly thought in the end, in the end, common sense would prevail and we'd go for the route of independence and links around the world. So I, I always thought we'd win. Um, I just didn't realise maybe at the time what a pivotal role UKIP would play in that. And if we were to go forward to 2016, did mm. you think, were you really confident that the Leave side would win? I mean, <laughs> the bookmakers' odds were more that Remain would win, it would be a close-run battle. Did you see that at the outset as, well, we might get 40, 45% of the vote and then we'll have to go again, a bit like the Scottish Nationalists? Or did you think, this is it, this is now do or die, this is D-Day, you know, I, my entire political career will either end in futility or success as the votes come in over the night? I remember the 1st of January, 2016, uh, waking up, uh, knowing the referendum would come that year. There was no way Cameron was going to wait. There was no way he was going to wait. You know, he, would, he didn't want this dogging the entirety of the Parliament. And I remember the 1st of January waking up and, and thinking hard about it. And my nightmare was, what if no other political figure backs leave? What if I'm completely on my own in this? Mm -hmm. uh, we're still, we're still going to get 43% but we're not going to win. You know, we had to get some Labour voices, we had to get, we needed some Conservative voices, and that was why it was so important that Boris Johnson joined the campaign, and whether he believed in it or not is a separate issue, but it was very important. And, and it was important in places like Surrey and Cheshire. You know, dealing with middle-class contentment uh, was a real issue. Um, and I think on the Labour side, I think, I think of all the figures on the Labour side that really cut through, I think Kate Hoey. Mm -hmm. I think Kate Huey really cut through uh, with people. So that was my nightmare. I thought, all the way through the campaign, I thought we could win. With a week to go, I thought we would win, comfortably. Uh, the momentum, I mean, you know, the battle on the Thames. You know, the, you know, the fishermen come up the Thames to be greeted by some loudmouth yob called Bob Geldof, yeah, yeah. who begins by abusing me. Well, that's fair enough but then starts abusing the fishermen. I mean, it was just, it was, everything was there. And I remember that morning uh, thinking, yeah, we're going to win this by five, ten points. The big M was with the Leave side. And then, of course, we had the horrendous murder yeah. of Joe Cox. And the campaign stopped. And we lost that momentum. So I always thought, the only time I lost my nerve was the day of the vote. Right. But well, where, I've, where, I've never told you this, that. Nigel, but I reckon you owe me a small fortune because I had a thousand pounds on leave to win yep. at three to one yep. on Betfair Exchange. Mm -hmm. And at 10.01 on this very screen, it came up, <laughs> Nigel Farage says leave has come just short and remains going to win. So I cashed out, got 300 <laughs> quid back, only to watch the unfolding <laughs> events. That's quite a ton of money well, you owe me for that press statement I, at 10.01. I'll tell you a funny PM. thing. i tell you a funny thing. Once 10 o'clock had come, and I realised that everything I'd... And I'd given a lot to this in 25 years. I really had. A hell of a lot. And I realised there was nothing I could do. It's rather like waiting for a photo finish in a race. Mm -hmm. You sort of prepare yourself for the worst. Trump was the same. 
Trump was utterly convinced he'd lost once the polls were closed. Um, just goes to check. I mean, I normally I was normally quite good at not saying things to journalists, but I should never pick, I should never have picked up the phone at ten o'clock that night. No, I agree, yeah, but yeah. anyway, it, it, it was what it. Anyway, I've forgiven you. You cost me a full <laughs> fortune, but you won the campaign. But right, the, so that's a bit of the history yeah. of it. But uh, I'm going to. What the hell was it all for? I mean, for years, this was supposed to be the decisive constitutional issue of our age, the biggest decision we're ever going to make. It was indeed the largest number of votes ever cast in Britain. Mm. In some parallel universe somewhere, Britain voted Remain by 52 to 48, mm. and Britain in that parallel universe is almost identical to the Britain we're living in now, isn't it? I'm trying to work well, out what... We, we managed to reduce well, tax on women's sanitary products, <laughs> and that's about it, isn't it? Well, let's have a think about two things here. Number one, Britain's place in the world. All right. I think there's no question that Britain's place in the world is now stronger as a result of Brexit. I thought the AUKUS deal actually said a hell of a lot. That would never have been done as EU members. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I thought that was significant. Uh, the vaccine rollout. I mean, we were free to make our own decisions, and the right decisions got made. The right woman got appointed, the job got done. That wouldn't have happened. You know, that wouldn't have happened. You know, because don't forget, the vaccine rollout in, in, in the EU was all down to um, an, an, an appointed commissioner from Cyprus who made such a whole lick of it, they all in the end went off in their own directions. I think the stance that Johnson's taken on Ukraine, now you may agree or disagree with that stance, but that's not the point. You know, actually freed from EU foreign policy, uh, we're able to do those things. So I think our place in the world is undoubtedly stronger as a result of Brexit. When it comes to what was it all for domestically, um, as we're under a government that masquerades as being conservative, but increasingly adopts a European model towards almost everything. Um, I remember in the founding days of UKIP, a chap on the NEC who was a lifelong Labour, hard left Labour, and you know, we'd after the NEC meeting go for a drink and we'd agree and disagree. We'd disagree on all sorts of stuff, and we had both agreed a truce that leaving the EU would give us back our birthright to mismanage our own country. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's what's happening. Look, there are clearly fantastic Brexit, Brexit opportunities that have been squandered. I will say this. You know, Mrs May's deal was a complete sellout, a complete catastrophe. Um, and I was bitterly disappointed that Jacob Rees-Mogg and Boris Johnson voted for it on the third time of asking. When Boris went in that October as, you know, the new Prime Minister to renegotiate. I was there, and the one commitment we got was that the UK would not be tied into the customs union. That was a win. But the rest of it was exactly the same as before. All the other criticisms that had come from the May deal were still exactly the same. The document was fundamentally the same. And I did try and warn people that it wasn't the right deal, but... In the end, I think Brexhaustion had just got the British public. They just, they just had enough of this saga. They just wanted it over. Um, and to that extent, Johnson was the right man for 2019. Um, a lot of people ask me, well, do you regret effectively endorsing him for the general election in that year? No. I thought the prospect of the Liberal Democrats winning lots of seats across the South and the West, the prospect of you know, Corbyn leading a coalition British government was too awful. So Johnson was the right man for the job, but it remains a terrible deal, and we see it, well, constitutionally with Northern Ireland, we see it with fishing. I mean, the other things we're bound by, the frustration mark, is that we're not doing the things that we're free to do. And I just... I think one of the things that's really completely absent is any comprehension on either front bench of what entrepreneurship genuinely is. You know, entrepreneurship is about, you know, a bloke who decides he's going to set up a local plumbing business mm -hmm. on his own, and his wife's going to be the accountant, and she's going to speak to the clients, and they take on a, a school leaver to work for them, yep. and they borrow a few bob from the bank to do it. They're entrepreneurs. They're entrepreneurs. And there's no connection with them, there's no understanding of them. In fact, Rishi Sunak actually, during lockdown, even threatened the self-employed, do you remember? Saying that in the future they must start you know, paying their fair share. Um, and it's on those areas where it's on those areas where classic supply-side reform that makes life easier for men and women to decide to go it on their own, to give it a go, to take a risk. But that, that was a 
British competence anyway, right? I mean, you know my antecedents. I used to be extremely pro-EU because I saw in it a kind of cosmopolitanism. Uh, let's break down trade barriers. You know, let's have mutual recognition of qualifications. You know, a really competing market. Yes, I know it's then you, you're sort of building a wall to the rest of the world. But, you know, a British ski instructor should be able to, you know, uh, <coughs> go and teach in the Alps and, and, and whatever. Um, but then what swung me over to the Leave side was that the European Union became ever more statist and intrusive, mm -hmm. that saw its aim not as breaking down barriers, but uh, determining the exact nature of a health warning on a cigarette packet in all 27 provinces, the exact maximum suction power of a vacuum cleaner, uh, you know, exactly how a light bulb should be. I, this is madness. And I thought that take back control meant, uh, and, and for years, I mean, some of them were a bit fun pointing at, you know, bendy banana regulations, but for years, the Eurosceptic campaign was, here are a load of nonsensical rules mm. which are at best irritating and at worst are holding back businesses. Let's take back control, get rid of them, have a regulatory framework yes. that's good for them. Whereas we've kept the whole bloody lot from what I can see. Uh, pretty much. And that's what needs to be done. That is what needs to be done. It is that stuff in terms of environmental law, employment law, uh, health and safety at work. Where it's excessive, it needs to be reduced. It needs to be I mean, even simplified would help. Uh, and this government have not grasped it, and I keep asking this question of senior Conservatives, at least the ones that will speak to me, um, uh, and, and I'm told we've been too busy with the pandemic. You know, we haven't had time to address this stuff, and they've got to get a grip on this pretty damn quickly. They've got, you know, they've been in power for a long time. The economics are moving against them. Um, if they're not able to mobilise entrepreneurial Britain to go out and vote for them en masse at the next election, they're pretty much doomed. Can you think about it? You've got somewhere between five and a half and six million people who are self-employed, you know, company directors, sole traders. You add to that their extended families. Now you're looking at a very, very big percentage of the UK voting population is connected to smaller, mm -hmm. small, genuinely small and medium-sized enterprises. And unless the Conservatives can get an overwhelming vote for them, from them, they've got no chance next time round. And how would you tackle it in a practical sense? I mean, do you think, for example, a radical solution, but I can't see why we couldn't embrace this, would be to sunset clause the entire Acquia Communitaire to say, let's give it a few years, let's say the whole lot falls on you, you, the 1st of January you 2030. You, you need you know, 10 years. Right, so we've got 10 years, yeah. the whole lot will fall on the 1st of January 2030. In the meantime, you've now got six or seven years to work out which bits you want to keep. But the default is it goes rather than it stays, whereas we've locked ourselves into a default. Well, you could do stays. that. It's not a bad idea. Um, Parliament would be busy day and night. For the, I mean, our MPs, yeah, but deciding our MPs would have to work hard. How about that? But they'd be um, on the back foot. They would be, they would be yeah. defending existing regulations rather than bringing in new British ones. I, I mean, let's see if Jacob Rees-Mogg comes up with a big idea, all right? Because he's now the guy that's been tasked to do this. By the way, I thought him turning up at the empty office in Whitehall and leaving the note, sorry I missed you, because yeah, yeah. you're all working from home. I thought it was just about the best thing the government's done for a very, very long time. Uh, let's see what Jacob comes up with, but they've got to do something and do it quickly. Moving on from um, Brexit, Europe, you're um, deciding that one referendum victory wasn't enough for you in your career. You've been challenging the government on net zero. Yeah. And uh, we, we've had your friend Richard Tyson recently. Yeah. We'll, we'll link to the debate I had with him. You think there should be a referendum on net zero environmental well, policy, is that right? I think the government should rethink its policy on net zero. I think we should have a more honest conversation with the British public about what's actually going on. I think if we have that debate, we'll realise what an act of self-harm we're putting upon ourselves. Uh, and in many areas, for no CO2 benefit whatsoever. You know, Boris Johnson says, isn't it marvellous that we've reduced our CO2 output by 44% since 1990? We're leading the world. Well, if you decide to import your energy rather than producing it yourself and export your manufacturing jobs, is it any wonder that your CO2 emissions have gone down, but globally they've gone up? <laughs> you know, you close a steel plant in Redcar, it moves to India, the steel's produced under lower environmental standards and the goods are shipped back. I mean, that's the madness of it. So, so I'm saying, unless we have a proper rational debate on this, that we, it, it is an issue that is so fundamental uh, that we have to have a referendum on it. But well, let's uh, let's have a rational debate on it, starting now. I once joked with you about... We just did! I, 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 I once <laughs> joked with you about ten years ago, Nigel, that is it true that UKIP don't believe in climate change because the 
ice hasn't melted in their gin and tonic <laughs> yet. Uh, 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 the, uh, I mean, do you think something should be done on decarbonisation? You just think this is a stupid policy? Or do you think we don't need to do anything on decarbonisation? Look, I think the jury is out on CO2. And I think because we've obsessed with CO2, we've actually ignored many other environmental problems that we're causing the world um, in terms of emissions, plastics, etc. I, I think we've gone way too hard on it. But even if, even if Lord Goldsmith is right... Um, and even if we are all going to be dead by June the 1st, unless we stop driving cars and doing all the normal things that we do, um, the fact is that we produced less than 1% of global CO2 and China built 80 big new coal-fired power stations last year. So we, I mean, we have to be realistic about this and sensible about this. Um, I mean, I, oddly, years ago, I would have thought of myself as, as being an environmentalist. You know, I believe in habitat creation and all of those things. So, but, you know, the point of this campaign that Richard and I are pushing is not to have a debate about climate change. It's to say what we're doing in the name of combating climate change is an act of self-harm and in many regards makes no difference to global CO2 output anyway. And do you think this speaks to the same script of Brexit in a way? R Richard Tice was making mm. this point, said that, that uh, you were saying, you know, all of the main parties, Peter Shaw endorsing Labour, John yeah, Bethune, yeah, yeah. were, were all as, as one, <laughs> the mainstream media. And this seems to be another issue that fits into that category. I'm not, I'm not saying that they're wrong, the mainstream party. I'm just saying that they seem to be united. Is there any difference, really, between Labour Party, Conservative Party, Liberal Democrat, SNP policy? Well, here's the odd thing, going back to your first question of this chat today, is that one of the reasons Brexit happened, one of the reasons the insurgency happened in England and Wales with the UKIP vote and then the Brexit Party vote was because the other parties had become the same a sort of social democratic mush in the middle. We've had this earthquake in British politics, uh, which Brexit caused, and we've now gone back to where we started. Mm -hmm. We've now gone back, particularly with Starmer, now leading Labour. I mean, where are the real... I mean, interesting, isn't it? Labour are now calling for reduced taxes... Labour is speaking up for small business. <laughs> I mean, where are we? There are almost no differences on anything. Um, and that brings us on, I mean, maybe, you know, not for, not for today, but I think all the while we maintain electoral funding rules, all the while we maintain the current postal voting register, all the while we maintain the first past the post electoral system, nothing's going to change. But, but you, you this issue, know. this issue, this issue, vital though it is, and important though it is to industry, business, uh, to people's household bills, where they've been penalised year after year after, and they're feeling it more now than ever before. Important though this issue is as a campaigning issue, in terms of an insurgent political movement, it doesn't have the same emotion that whether you're part of the European Union or, Union or not does. Uh, and it's very, I, I would say, difficult, nigh impossible for a political party to frighten the, the life out of the establishment by standing candidates against them on the basis of net zero. But you, you, you mentioned, I mean, obviously Brexit had uh, all of the um, associated tropes of, a, of an insurgency and mm. quite a lot of emotion attached to it. Yeah. You know, do you feel patriotic or yeah. whatever? It wasn't just a, you know, I looked at it in a rather boring, metropolitan, elite, technocratic way, but I totally understand people felt it was about their country and their yeah. pride. It wasn't yeah. so much about, is GDP going to go up 3% or down 1%? But you were mentioning that there's now a sort of social democratic consensus. Mm. I, the, the supporters of yours would say that you were basically, and your parties, Brexit Party and mm. UKIP, were a sort of safety valve in the electoral system and the constitution. You weren't going to win, but you were going to drain so many votes and supporters from probably <coughs> disproportionately the Tory party no, no, that the no, Tory no, party would have no. to switch onto but your ground. I mean, that is absolute rubbish, you know. That is absolute rubbish. Um, the 2015 general election, the four million UKIP votes hurt Labour far more than it hurt the Conservatives. There is no... Cameron wrote his resignation letter in Chequers that evening. And what you saw all over England uh, were those seats that we now call red wall seats. Mm -hmm. Well, you saw UKIP getting 10,000 votes in seat after seat after seat and seats that had been way up on Labour's target list. Uh, they didn't come anywhere near. No, 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 no. We hurt the Labour Party far more in 2015. And, and this is still something that is not understood fully. These, these red wall voters that we're talking about, they were nearly every one of them came through the gateway drug of UKIP. Exactly. You know? okay. So my, my point was not necessarily that 80% of your votes were former Tories. It's that 
one political party, it happened to be the Conservatives ah, that did it. So well, you have got to move yeah, onto yeah. Farage's ground. He yeah. is, he's got yeah, 10,000 yeah. votes in these well, seats. They were, I mean, if we yeah. don't get those voters, yeah. we can't win elections. He, so we, we need to now yeah. steal Nigel's clothes and run, run wearing his clothes, and then we'll win the election. Cameron was terrified of defections. And they were happening all over the country. We were, I think 22 former Tory MPs joined UKIP. Um, association chairmen all over the country were joining UKIP. Uh, and then where, where Cameron really got the heebie-jeebies was that sitting Tory members of Parliament would defect to UKIP. Now, the truth of that story is we had conversations with lots of them. But I'd said, rightly or wrongly, I'd said from the start, if they're going to defect... We've got to have a by-election. We've got to have a by-election as a matter of principle. And so there are... In fact, there's, there's even a cabinet minister who would have defected, but when we polled the seat, it was just, the Tory majority was just too big. So in the end, it was Reckless and Carswell that did defect, um, and good for them, and called by-elections. It was a very important part of the process. But one of the reasons Cameron got so scared, and you're going to love this, it's because he thought 15 or 20 were going to go. He thought the whole thing was about a fall down around his ears. And a piece appeared in one of the gossip columns about Stuart Wheeler, the late Stuart Wheeler, great Stuart Wheeler, uh, being seen at a particular Italian restaurant just off Berkeley Square with various members of Parliament. So Stuart rang me up. He said, oh, no, I'm so sorry, Nigel. I've caused you this embarrassment that uh, the press have found out where I'm taking these Tory MPs for lunch. I promise you I said you sent the press I, to I, the I restaurant. Promise, yeah, yeah. I promise I won't do it again. I said, Stuart, go every bloody day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Take someone every day. So truth of it is that Cameron's fear of defections was greater than the reality sure, was. Sure, Because there weren't many that could win by it. But the, the, the interesting, and I know you, you've spoken fondly of the success that the Canadian Reform Party had, and I guess this yeah. sort of, the Reform yeah. Party now is the sort of third iteration yeah. of, sort of UKIP, and a Brexit party was a new thing, but sort of a, a, yeah. a different... Brand, and now the Reform Party. Yeah. What I was sort of asking was, is there a way in which votes or malcontent with the social democratic consensus mm. might lead to a block of voters or yeah. or a few rogue radical MPs sort of that is enough not necessarily to win seats in its own right maybe not even sort of hold too many deposits but for I don't know probably the Conservative Party perhaps others to think Crikey O'Reilly, there are these people who are saying net zero is too expensive, that taxes are too high, we need to deregulate, and they are getting voters that we need. Could well, you, that act yes, as a, yes, to no, bring no, no, back, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. bring a party away from the social democratic yeah, consensus? Yeah. In terms of winning elections, I mean, I would point out, Mark, that I did win the 2014 European election, the 2019 European election. They were national elections, and nobody's ever won two national elections leading two different parties, so that's not a bad answer for you. <laughs> um, uh, the Wakefield by-election. You know, and, um, by the way, you know, I, you know, my passing gift with Brexit done, not perfectly, but done, was, was to set up the concept of Reform UK, because I do actually think we need wholesale reform. I think the system is completely, hopelessly out of date. Uh, but I decided for myself, you know, that after nearly 21 years in the European Parliament, after best part 30 years of campaigning, uh, that I'd had enough of being in the front line. I, I, I think I've kind of... You know, You've done my, your bit. I, I think I probably have done my bit. Um, so Richard's taken it on, and very good luck to him. I'm honorary president. I've been kicked upstairs. Um, but I still want the agenda to succeed. The Wakefield by-election is a big opportunity for this. You know, if, 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 if Tyson and the team can get, a, can get an appreciable vote in that by-election in Wakefield, that will begin to have those kind of ripples that you're talking about. And we're, we're here at the Institute of Economic Affairs, spoken a lot about the environment and um, sort of rise of populism. Let me touch on the rise of populism. Who's the most... I mean, the, the, it's thrown up a whole bunch of personalities across the globe. And we've seen, you know, Marine Le Pen lost the presidential election quite decisively. We've got a higher vote than she did last <coughs> time. Yeah. Um, you, you have been, you know, the leader of, a, uh, of an insurgent move, uh, movement here. Um, Piers Morgan, I don't know where you place him on the play. Who's the most lovable character? Nigel Farage, Donald Trump or Piers Morgan? Which of you is the most <laughs> lovable of the three? Well, well, I don't think the most dishonest of the three is. Because <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't tell you what Piers Morgan stands for, other than lockdown, 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 wear masks, support Black Lives Matter, and support the tearing down of historic statues in Bristol. There we are. Good luck with all of that. Um, the most lovable. 
I don't know. I think, you know, I tell you what, if you take on the establishment, you'll be demonised. And of that, there's no doubt. You know, um, I, I hope what I did actually brought a smile to a few people's faces as well. I, I did try and make it fun on the journey. Uh, the Donald inspires... The Donald's strange in one way, because... In several ways. Because well, but private Donald Trump and public Donald Trump are just different people. I was at Mar-a-Lago... Well, Piers has told you this already, of course, but <laughs> I, I, was at, I was at Mar-a-Lago two and a half weeks ago. I mean, he was just the life and soul of the party. You know, we had a private meeting. We then went into the, the terrace restaurant, and there were probably sort of 40, 50 diners on the terrace. I mean, you know, he literally goes around, he speaks to everybody. He was even DJing. He was DJing on his laptop, you know, playing requests, and just huge fun to be with, enormously funny. And you put him on a platform, and it's kind of all this. That's done very well. Um, but... But is he speaking to the? I mean, it's been. Oh, long. is he speaking to the same sort of insert? Oh, like, is yeah. there a connection yeah. between Trump and Brexit? Oh, There's yeah, a sort yeah, of disillusioned yeah, 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 block yeah, yeah. of voters. It's the same. Who are now homeless, and, yeah. and we're seeing a realignment in politics, really, across the democratic Western world as a consequence. We briefly saw it in the 80s. We saw that realignment with, with Reagan. You know, we saw the Reagan Democrats, as they were called, mm -hmm. that got him that massive victory in 84. He, 49 states he won, you know. Uh, we saw it with Thatcher. We saw, you know, I mean, two million trade union members voted Conservative in 1979. It seems incredible, but it's true, because they knew the game was up and something had to change. And then we saw John Howard mm -hmm. in Australia doing exactly the same thing. So we saw that phenomenon in the 80s into the early 90s. Then, of course, the globalists took over. You know, the Blairs, the Clintons, the Schroders. Whatever happened to him? <laughs> and, and the lesson... The lesson of all of this for conservative politics is very clear. No conservative party can win a majority in the Western world without blue-collar support. It's just as simple as that. And that's what the Red Wall phenomenon is all about, isn't it? It's about skilled labour. It's about people that... We, you know, blue-collar sounds derogatory. I don't mean it to be that at all. Um, that's what it's all about. So do you think the Red Wall's the sort of new Essex? I mean, I was looking back at the history books when Essex <laughs> voted for Margaret Thatcher so decisively. Yeah. It was sort of assumed fleetingly, ah, well, you're going to have to spend a lot more on welfare in Essex and you're going to have to have a lot more government intervention <laughs> no, in Essex. No, it, it turned out to be the throbbing heartland yeah. of the Thatcherite revolution. They wanted lower taxes, yeah. lower regulation, yeah. get the government out of my way, I want to make my own money, I want to keep yeah. more of my own money. Do you think that's what's happening in the Red Wall, that the, the Conservative Party is actually misidentified the vote. The assumption is, ah, oh, well, we've got to keep them happy. We've got to build a new roundabout in Rotherham or whatever it might be. No. Uh, yeah, and and yeah. actually, they should be slashing yeah. tax, slashing regulations. They want their kids to get a good education. Yeah. They want their kids to get high-earning jobs. They want their kids to buy houses. Um, but they do want some things from the state. You know, they'd like to see a GP, which isn't happening. Um, so the levels of disenchant... Oh, nearly forgot. They'd also like the promises and immigration to be honoured, which they're not. And, you know, we see the cross-channel traffic, and it's enraging people in those seats. When they realise that actually the points-based system that Johnson's government has put in place has lowered standards to the extent that I have no doubt that 2022 will be the biggest ever year for net migration into Britain, they're going to be absolutely hopping mad. But this is yet another example of something which we can now mismanage ourselves rather than having mismanaged for us from Brussels, right? True. <laughs> and so do you think, I mean, give us some cheer before, I'll come to the audience for questions in just a minute, but, but, but try and give me a little bit of hope and cheer. Uh, we feel a bit lonely here at the IEA. I bet we argue do. for freer markets oh, and lower taxes and awesome. less regulation. Did it, did. And barely a day passes <laughs> without there being an excuse from the from all mainstream political parties, that money, more money needs to be spent, mm. more... Reg I mean, we're, we're, the, the government's now just... It, it suggests we're going to have a state regulator for bloody English football. Mm. Uh, we're going to be debating the offside rule over the dispatch box between politicians. Uh, we're bringing in all sorts of ridiculous bans on, you know, ban adverts for jam and mustard and God knows what else online, because it's bad for you and that's your waistline. The nanny state's out of control. Regulation, I say, not only have we not burnt some of the EU stuff, uh, so Humphrey Appleby's passing an 
awful lot of our own taxes, the highest <laughs> level as proportional national income since Clement Attlee's government. Uh, how the hell are we going to turn this tanker around? We've lost, haven't we? No, we haven't lost because it's all, it, it is all reversible. I mean, that's the point. It is all reversible. Um, but we are going to have to get, uh, and it won't be the Labour Party, that's for certain, we're going to have to get a Conservative Party that starts to believe in this stuff. How do we do that? Well, there are lots of ways of doing it. You know, one way of doing it is through media influence. One way of doing it is through, you know, reform, giving them a kicking in Wakefield, and, 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 and you know, the reform vote being bigger than the margin by which Labour win the by-election. There are lots of ways in which we can do it. Um, I think we do, you know, we, we do tend through history to have pendulums that go back and forth on social attitudes, on economic behaviour. Um, I wouldn't be that pessimistic. And I would say this, as we're coming towards the end, actually, even though we have made a bit of a whole of it, as Brexit Britain, there is a bit more self-confidence around in the country. There's a bit more belief that actually we can do these things, that we're good enough to have these things. And I think a feeling, a growing feeling, that it's our leaders who are not cutting the mustard. It's our leaders that are not up to scratch. I do think there is genuinely, despite the economic situation, there is a greater feeling within the country and from the eyes of the rest of the world that this is now potentially a much stronger country than it was now that we've cut that Gordian knot with Europe. So I'm, I still believe very strongly it was the right thing to do. I think we'll look back in 20, 30, 40, 50 years' time uh, and think it was a big historic break. We just need, and if one's being frank about it, you know, Boris Johnson was never a Conservative. Never a Conservative. Doesn't believe in anything Conservative. It's, it, I mean, he's very good at conning people come elections. But they've got... When you say sort of pro-business, sort of, you know... He doesn't know what business is. <laughs> what do we mean pro-business? I mean, he, he thinks capitalism is the best economic system for the country, doesn't he? Well, he's not acting like that, is he? No, he's not. He's not. I, look, he probably in big, broad brushstrokes thinks that. But does he actually understand business? Who in the Conservative Party? You know, Rishi worked for Goldman Sachs. I mean, great. You know, that, that's hardly entrepreneurial Britain that we're talking about. I mean, George Osborne's connection with business. He never even had a paper round, did he? Let alone had a job. Um, no, I mean, look, you know, the, 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 when Thatcher came through the Keith Joseph doctrine... Um, in the mid-70s, you know, it, 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 it was a complete turn in the Conservative Party that put the country on a different track, arguably saved the country, actually, from the mess that it was in. Um, I wouldn't give up. Uh, Johnson will not be PM for that much longer. There's a big opportunity for the Conservatives now to get this right. And I just wonder whether you think there might be a lasting psychological impact of project fear having been proven false. You know, we were told if we had the audacity to leave that, uh, you know, there would be 20 mile tailbacks at Dover, the economy would tank, there'd be an outbreak of super gonorrhea, Godzilla would rise from the River Thames, I can't remember what else, were, what, what other, and sort of the amazing thing was basically nothing happened. I've got to admit, the level of disruption, the minimal level of disruption surprised even me. I was expecting yeah. it to be disruptive yeah. for a few weeks, but perhaps worth it in the long term. You would, I mean, nothing happened at all. There was no disruption. Does that mean that we can sort of say the state, well, the, you know, the emperor's got no clothes, really, when it, when it, when it says, oh, my God, if we, were, if we were to remove the political elite and the establishment from this area of life, you're all going to hell in a handcart. Well, that has not proven to be accurate in this circumstance. You're right, but the really big one, the really big one, are successive lockdowns. When Joe Public wakes up to the fact that the long-term health impact of lockdown is going to be much greater in terms of disease and death than however many we may have saved by locking ourselves inside um, our houses for month after month, uh, that's when trust with government will break completely. Well, if you enjoyed that conversation, why not watch one of these other videos? And while you're here, remember to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way, you'll never miss out on a single IEA broadcast.